Okay, so let's see what happens to Darkus now he's in the uh, house of the cousins next door, Humphrey and Pickering. Humphrey clapped happily. Now, Pickering stood in front of Darkus with his arms crossed. You're going to tell me about the gang you work for and what they plan when they plan to rob me. Now you're being ridiculous, Picker Pickers. Humphrey's face split into a huge grin. No one in their right mind would steal that pile of rotting junk out there. Pickering reached down and picked the axe up off the floor. What I mean is, Humphrey said hurriedly, it's more likely he's a spy from the council, gathering evidence so they can evict us. Pickering as eyes shot wide open and then narrowed as he considered this possibility. Then we definitely can't let him go. That's why I thought we should make him into a pie, Humphrey said helpfully. I'll let you have him once you've got rid of the insects, Pickering said, offering his hand to his cousin. Deal, Humphrey grinned, shaking it. I'm not from the council, or a gang, or a thief, Darkus cried. I'm just a kid. I heard you arguing and I saw the beetles and... Well, that's what they you would say, Pickering cut him off. We're not idiots, you know. He looked at Humphrey. Well, I'm not. He picked up a giant t-shirt from the floor and ripped a strip from it. Hey, that's my shirt, Humphrey protested. Really? It looks like a dirty old rag, said Pickering, resting his axe against the armchair and trying to gag over, tying the gag over Darkus's mouth. Darkus pulled his head back, trying to resist, but the horrid rag closed over his mouth, smelling like a musty dead animal. It made him think of maggots and he retched. Now, give me that tub. Humphrey did as he was told and prized off the lid. Darkus wriggled, the skin on his wrists burning as he tried to get free from the ropes that held him tight. He had to get away. Uncle Max was right. These men were dangerous. Pickering cupped his hands, scooping up, up a load of cranberry sauce and splattering it down, down on Darkus's head. It was cold and sticky, making, making him shiver as it dripped slowly down his back. Hey, don't waste it, Humphrey protested. That's good stuff. I'll get you some more. Pickering reached down for another handful. Now you listen to me, boy. This stuff... He held his hands under Darkus's nose. His cranberry sauce, and it can't have escaped your notice that right behind you is a monstrous hive of creepy crawlies full of millions of disgusting beetles that beasties that bite and sting and burrow and scratch. And do you know what they love to eat most of all in the whole wide world? Pickering smeared a handful of sauce across Darkus's face. Cranberry sauce. Darkus shuddered as the cold sauce oozed down his neck and chest. Pickering pushed up the sleeves of his green jumper and rubbed sauce down his arms. Now, if you don't tell me who you sent you to spy on us, he was nose to nose with Darkus, I'm going to let those creepy crawlies eat you alive. Darkus stared at Pickering. He supposed it made sense that these beetles would like cranberry sauce, especially as Humphrey kept a bucket of it in his room. Baxter liked sweet fruits too, but thanks to his beetle handbook, Darkus knew something Pickering didn't. A lot of beetles are vegetarian. First, they'll munch through the cranberry sauce and then they'll burrow under your skin. Pickering lifted another handful of the pink gloop. Next, they'll drink your blood and dine on your muscles until only your puny bones are left. He pulled up Darkus's trouser leg and spattered the sauce onto his shins. And there are even some nasty critters in there who eat bones. Pickering was obviously enjoying himself. So this is your last chance. He pulled down the rag. What do you have to say for yourself? I'm from next door, Darkus insisted. I live next door. Liar. Pickering replaced the rag angrily. The professor who lives next door doesn't have children. Darkus struggled against the ropes, but it was no use. Maybe you'll feel like talking after the beetles have stripped all the skin from your body. Pickering gave a horrible, simpering laugh. I wanted to do that, Humphrey sulked. Look, here comes a big, ugly bla uh, big black ugly one with a giant horn. Oh dear, he looks hungry. Darkus looked down and almost wept with relief to see Baxter crawling across the floor towards him. The beetle, his beetle, had heard him call. 
He didn't need a control test to know that Baxter understood him. He immediately felt braver and the fear that fluttered around his chest calmed down. I'm hungry, Humphrey complained, staring at Darkus. A loud knock sounded on the front door downstairs. Well, who on earth can that be? Pickering stood up straight and looked over his shoulder like a startled meerkat. I don't know, Humphrey shrugged. Pickering grabbed his cousin's doughy arm and brought him out into the hall. I'm not done with you yet, he growled at Darkus, slamming the door shut. Darkus immediately tried to reach the knots holding his wrists together, but his fingers couldn't get a grip on the rope. A familiar weight pressed down on his shoulder as Baxter landed and then crawled to the back of his neck where his gag was tied. He felt the beetle slide his horn up between the gag and his skin, pulling at the cloth. He was sawing at it. After a few seconds, the gag slipped down and Darkus spat it out, gladly pulling in a lungful of clean air. Baxter, boy, am I glad to see you, he whispered. Can you help with the ropes too? Baxter turned to the mountain of cups and rubbed his hind leg against his elytra, making a series of strange chirping noises. Darkus hadn't heard Baxter make a noise like that before. He realised it must be what his book called stridulation. A sighing sound like sugar pouring into a jar filled the room as the beetles emerged from their mountain and scuttled towards him. Pickering and Humphrey were still outside the door arguing. We can't let anyone in in case they find the boy. Pickering sounded agitated. What if it's the police? Humphrey asked. The police? Pickering squealed. Why would it be the police? Er, uh, that thing the boy said about kidnapping being illegal. But we've only just done it. How would they know he was here? I don't know. You go downstairs and answer the door. Why me? What will I say? Something stupid, probably. Pickering made a frustrated, strangled sound. The persistent knocking came again. All right, we'll both go, Pickering declared, and Darkus heard them clomping down the stairs. He felt a ticklish sensation as beetles started crawling up his legs. He sucked in his breath, unsure of how he felt about being covered in beetles, but soon they were climbing up his back, clambering round his neck and scurrying through his hair. Shivers rippled up and down his spine as tiny clawed feet walked across his skin. Darkus let out a sigh as he realised he didn't mind them being on him at all. They were heavy. It was like being buried in sand, but the feeling of so many beetles was quite nice. He tried not to laugh as they tickled him and to keep still. He didn't want to squash anyone. With his eyes closed, covered head to toe in beetles, he thought about his dad. You're not going to believe this when I tell you, he said to him silently. In seconds, he could move his left arm. He tested the ropes. Yes, both of his hands were free. He tried his feet and the cords fell away. The beetles had chewed, burrowed and cut all the way through them. Darkus got up carefully, splattering a blob of cranberry sauce on the floor and crouched down to thank the beetles who'd rescued him. He was delighted to see the gaggle of red giraffe-necked weevils amongst the horde and the flashy jewel beetles too. But the most impressive beetle on the floor by far was a gigantic goliath beetle, easily recognised by its black and white zebra-like markings. It stood quite still, its antennae barely twitching, and Darkus wondered if it was very old. No illustration in any book could capture how awesome these beetles were. Darkus touched his face. It wasn't even tacky. The beetles had freed him and given him a wash. Thank you, he whispered. You're all amazing. Outside, the streetlight flickered on, casting a yellow glow in the room. It must be nearly six o'clock. Uncle Max would be home soon. Darkus heard voices downstairs. Pickering and Humphrey must have opened the door. And suddenly the beetles were withdrawing, quickly like a departing shadow, back into the mountain of cups. Something seemed to have spooked them. Only the Goliath beetle moved slowly. Darkus ran silently down uh, to the window and looked down into the street. The sleek black car he'd seen outside the museum was parked across the road. A shock of fear gripped his stomach. Lucretia Cutter was here, but why? He looked over his shoulder at the mountain and the realisation hit him. It was full of spectacular beetles. Lucretia Cutter must be interested in beetles or she wouldn't sponsor the Natural History Museum's collection. And that unsettling yellow ladybird he'd seen this morning was something to do with her too. Uncle Max clearly thought so. Lucretia Cutter could only be here for one reason. For the beetles. But how did she know they were even here? 
He remembered what Pickering had said about the two men dressed in black wearing face masks and rubber gloves. Did they work for Lucretia Cutter? Darkus crouched down with his back against the giant pink armchair and powered his heels into the floor as he pushed against it with all his strength, budging it jerkily across the floor. It was a heavy piece of furniture and wider than the door frame. He wedged it up against the closed door under the handle and then he turned back to the mountain. Listen, he said urgently, you're all in terrible danger. Lucretia Cutter is here. She's bad news. I don't know what she wants, but... He thought about all the beetles in drawers with pins through them. I think if she sees you, she'll want to kill you. Do you understand? You mustn't let her get in here. He scooped up Baxter. We have to go, but we'll be back, I promise. Darkus ran to the window ledge, throwing Baxter into the air as he jumped out towards the sycamore tree. He caught hold of the first branch, dropped down to the one below and swung to the ground, landing in a crouch as Baxter glided down and settled on his shoulder.